All right, so we're finally getting down to capillary collection. Why is capillary, what is capillary collection? Someone tell me. Where you stick your skin, but we've been doing that all class. Where's cap, let's, let's back up a little. Where are the capillaries in, with regard to your um, circulatory system? On the outer what? Of, there's all kinds of layers in the body. Try to be a little more specific. Are they carrying venous blood or arterial blood? Both. They're right in the middle, right? That's where the cell uh, exchanges nutrients, takes up waste, things like that. And so they form fine mesh nets that cover our organs all in our skin. Whenever we uh, need to get more blood to the surface of our skin, like for thermal regulation, you know, temperature is too cold, it'll shrink back. These are the things that dilate and bring that blood in. Okay. And so there's three types of blood. There was venous, arterious, or arterial blood, and then capillary blood. And so capillary blood has its own properties just like venous blood and arterial blood. You remember venous blood is low in what? What gas? Blue returning to the heart, it's D. Oxygenated. Arterial blood is rich in oxygen. Well, capillary is kind of right in the middle. And things like that, in terms of the gases and the materials that are carried in capillary blood, are different from venous versus arterial. Like glucose, potassium, and other electrolytes and things like that. So that means that capillary blood is good for some testing, but not good for other testing. Let's look here on page 161. Um, <clears throat> will you read that first three paragraphs for me, Miss Angel? What is venous thrombosis? It's a clot. Okay. Um, I'll finish for you here. Because venipuncture increases the risk of venous thrombosis, other patients may be at risk for serious complications associated with deep venipuncture, including itrogenic anemia. What is that? That can happen to like newborns where they count milliliters every time they take out or put something in one of those. That word itrogenic is a fancy word for harming someone with a medical experiment or procedure. Here's a, like when you take um, a drug and you have a bad side effect. Or another good example is a little botomy. Have you ever seen, heard of this before? They used to do these real popular back in the 50s and 60s. This is called the intraorbital lobotomy, and they would take a, like an ice pick, and they would tap it into your orbit, and just kind of ream out your frontal cortex to help you with any mood disorders you had, like schizophrenia. I think it happened to women like, um, of the people, the 20,000 people were done in 1950s, like 70% were women. Up into the 60s, sort of. Just FYI. Yeah, it's lobotomy. And I'm just talking about how a medical procedure can sometimes harm someone, like drawing too much blood. I'm just trying to drive home the definition of that word and just give you a little FYI cool fact there. Lobotomy. You heard people say, oh, he should be lobotomized. No, that's the first I've ever heard of that. They still do it nowadays, but it's for like a region of your brain that causes seizures maybe. They'll go in and cut that region out. Well, it's still lobotomy. Otomy meaning to cut out, lobe, lobotomy, lobe ring. So we've discussed a few reasons why um, capillary collection is good. It's good on preemies and newborns who may not have a whole lot of blood to take, plus their veins are too small. It's good for ancillary testing, like glucose monitoring, okay? Um, especially for those folk who have to do it multiple times a day and we don't want to be sticking their vein. People with fragile skin and stuff like that. All right. Um, just reading on here, it says capillary collection is usually the preferred method of collection for newborns, infants, and children younger than two. Children younger than two. So you can imagine a little, little baby walking in the office. They need to get some blood drawn. We don't want to necessarily uh, draw out of their vein. We can do capillary collection for them. Okay. Uh, young children have smaller veins and lower blood volume. makes all that difficult. 
Um, in addition to serving as a substitute for venipuncture, capillary blood gas determination can be an alternative to an arterial blood gas determination. Uh, the next chapter or so is arterial blood gas collection we'll talk about, but where does the sample come from if you're drawing an arterial blood gas? Your artery. Right, and why is that bad as opposed to, how can that be more risky as opposed to just drawing a vein? You can bleed out. Arteries are important sources of blood for the tissues that's downstream. So if you mess one up, it gets inflamed, gets infected. Everything below it's going to be hurting. Okay, so you all are actually okay and approved to draw arterial blood gases with right training. And usually it comes from the radial artery. I've got a needle over there for it. It's, it's a big old long needle. Yeah, it hurts too, doesn't it? Yeah. I think I've had that well, time. usually they numb it up first. A good, a, a nice person will. And also the respiratory therapists do it too. And so either one of those two folks can do it. Nurses need to be specially trained. And I'm not even sure as an LPN if I have that scope of practice. Um, so it's good for some blood gas, capillary, but it's obviously going to be a little bit different than arterial blood draw, right? <clears throat> On the next page here, I'm looking at differences between what we've been doing, which is venous and capillary. Uh, towards the end of that first paragraph, it says small amounts of tissue fluid from the puncture site may also be in the sample, especially in the first drop. There's a good hint as to why when we do a, a, a glucose check, we wipe away that first drop of blood and we use the second one for our, our sample. All right, the level of substances are the same in both capillary and venous blood, but this is not the case for all substances. For instance, the normal potassium reading attained by capillary is lower than that you would get out of your vein in a plasma sample. Okay, so that's what I meant by saying, well, potassium is not a good test to perform with capillary blood. Because of those differences, results obtained by these two techniques cannot be compared. Okay, this is also why if you walk into a, a, a patient's room and you were just there the morning before drawing um, a potassium level, you need to make sure you use the same method to obtain that blood as you did the day before not draw from here one day and draw from here the next day because you're going to be reporting two different methods and it's going to give you two different values and so that's not going to be true data from what you're trying to see right you understand why that would be different <clears throat> any questions about that so repeated draws need to be performed in the same manner that means you need to mark where you drew your blood from on your sample left ac or right finger. It's assumed that if you drew from the left AC, you got it with a needle and it's a venous stick. And if it's the left finger, it's a capillary stick. Okay? You're not going to get a needle in there to get blood out on me. <laughs> unless I'm comatose. <laughs> and then I'm going to haunt you after I'm dead. <laughs> now we got a little bit of understanding about why capillary collection is different, important, good, and not good for some stuff. Let's talk about the stuff we used to do it with. All right? So there's a few different devices. Pretty much everybody is familiar with these. Show one of those to the camera over there. These are just regular old lancets. Just stick it in front of it. That's right there. Other side. Have you ever seen a camera before? Oh. Not too close. No, it's good. Okay, here's another one. You can go ahead and take the tabs out of them if you want. I've got a few different kinds. What's up? You take this and you usually twist them and pull. And now it's armed. And if you push this button on the bottom, that needle went. You take the blue completely push. out? Yeah. Because it's, it's meant to be pushed up against your finger. And when you click it, Yeah, when you click it, it'll go in at a certain depth, and then you got just enough to get a blood, sample of blood there. Okay, this is the most common you see people at home using or in the hospital need to check your sugar, ma'am. I'm going to use one of these. Pop. Okay, it's just a lancet. Um, for example, the depths of them are different. I don't know what the one you have in your hand is. It's probably the same, but like the one I'm giving you right now, just a different style. It says right here, this depth is one millimeter. 
and it's a 28 gauge needle. So it's very little needle, and it only goes in your skin one millimeter. Does everybody know what a millimeter is? Raise your hand if you know for sure what a millimeter is. Okay, you know what a meter stick is? Okay, there is a thousand millimeters in that meter stick. There's a hundred centimeters in it. Okay, millimeter is very small, about the width of a human hair or, or a little bit bigger or smaller than that. Okay, so it's a very small distance going in. Is it an eighth tick, a sixteenth tick? Let's look at no, the. No, it, it's four ticks from the big number. <laughs> well, look here. So if this is the big number, yeah. is it one of these ticks or is it one of the sixteenth ticks no, and beside it? Because this is an eighth and this is a sixteenth. That's the six. It's four ticks that way. See, this one's labeled. This is what you need to be using. I know. No. This is a totally different ball game. This is, <laughs> it's not even metric, so. Anyways. Anyways, um, so the OSHA, everybody knows who OSHA is, at least. Um, they say some of these are need, um, these need to be disposable one-time use, okay, and safely able to be used by people like you. Um, of course, there's different lengths and gauge of needles in, in some of these lancets, uh, but there's some specifically designed for those newborns and preemies we talked about, okay? And that's what I'm passing out now. Uh, I don't care if you open it. I just don't want you to activate it. There's one that's already open. So these are different in that they don't just go boink and puncture the skin. They have a, a blade that comes out and swipes it like an arc. Well, the, the reasoning the book gives because of the fat issue, I think, is when you make a slice as opposed to a puncture, it bruises less. There's less nerve severed. And so just overall easier to do. Well, why don't they do that for everyone? I don't know, maybe it's more expensive to manufacture these. But these also come in different depths and lengths. And what I mean by depth, you know, but the length of the arc. So it could be like a one millimeter arc and a one millimeter depth or a 2.5 millimeter arc. Just look at the back of these and you'll see what I'm saying. The color codes for like preemie and newborn and things like that. Um, what size is, pre is it say preemie on it? Yeah. Okay, so that's another type of capillary puncture device. We're still getting capillary blood, it's just the top of the skin. Um, they also have these things that's an actual laser that you can go zoop, zoop, and it's just got like a cover on it. You can just throw away a disposable cover like a thermometer cover and put a new one on and go zip and zip the next one. Um, it's called a laserette, laser lancing device here at the bottom of page 162. Um, what about the actual blood once we get it out now that we've kind of learned about how we get the blood out with these devices here what about the blood what do we put it in, in a bowl in a goblet <laughs> you said a bowl it <laughs> here's a bullet it's just a tiny like your vacuum tainers except there's no vacuum in it they have different tops with different additives some of them have separating gel in them it's just yeah, and you can go ahead and take it off and look. They got like a little scoop on them. So when you poke it, you can dip it in there. Now your book tells you specifically you don't want to scrape the blood off because that causes platelet aggregation or activation and clots start to form. And so you just want to let it run onto it. Oh, yeah, so there's lines on this one. And when you're doing a baby's foot, there's all kinds of blood that comes out. It, it's easy to fill it up. I remember it being done to Henry when he was born a little while back. And this happens for every preemie. Like in Kentucky, it's a law that after they're born, either the day after or the day after, blood is drawn and they're tested for like 22 different genetic anomalies or defects, like muscular dystrophy and 
um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, I think. So you got capillary tubes. And there's a couple special different ones, and it, the book talks about on 163, and it goes over to 164 about um, microhematocrit tubes, and some of them aren't really used anymore. Well, that's all great. I'll let you read that on your own. But this is a good example of the tubes right here, okay? So other supplies, you still got your good old alcohol pads you'll be using and your stuff to catch blood like cotton balls or gauze. And you need to put your stuff in a sharps container like usual. Um, the last thing is, uh, remember what I was talking about bringing blood to the surface? If, um, because of temperature change? Well, sometimes these are handy to use. This is a heel warmer and it's just uh, like a hot hand and you can put that on the skin and it will dilate those vessels and bring blood to it. You can also use a hot paper towel from under the faucet or a washcloth. Just be sure you're not burning your patients. You're not leaving those on longer than you should. You're not forgetting about them in the bed underneath the thigh or something like that. Be safe with them. Okay, because elderly people have fragile thin skin and so do babies. But that pretty much sums up your equipment. Let's talk about how, um, how do you know which to choose when you're doing one of these on a preemie or newborn or when you're sticking in a or a child under two, or older than two years old or younger than two years old, I'm sorry. How do you know how deep to go and where to stick them? So this is sort of like a nurse or a medical assistant knowing where to give a shot with what length of needle and where that's appropriate for different sites. Like if I need to give you an antibiotic, I need to go into a muscle. So I need a needle that's at least an inch and a half long. And I can select sites. I know there's a good muscle in or the um, gluteus max, gluteus medius, and vastus lateralis, things like that. And you got to be able to choose sites and depths based on what you know. But there's not a whole lot to know, so don't fret. All right, for adults and children older than one, Dermal punctures are almost always performed on the fingertips. Um, and it says the best sites are their palmar surface. Everybody show me their palmar surface of your hand. Okay. Of the distal segments. Where's the distal segments of your fingers? Furthest away, right? Proximal distal. Good job. Of the third and fourth, third and fourth fingers. Ring finger. Thumb is likely to be calloused. And the index finger nerve endings are extra because this is your feeler. All right? So it tells you not to use those. It says pinky is just not enough flesh there. If the fingers cannot be used, the big toe may be an option. I mean, what if the patient doesn't have fingers or hands? I still can't remember how... I had a patient in the nursing home. I took care of a few patients that were quadriplegic or had all, all limbs amputated. One of them was because of a bacterial infection she got in the VA. I still can't remember how we checked her, her sugar. I need to call one of my old coworkers um, and, and figure out how we did that. Because I know she was diabetic. Can you check it I mean, I guess you could do a capillary stick there. Usually you give the insulin there, though. I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on it, but earlobes are not recommended or ever used. Okay, don't use earlobes. It should be in the fleshy center of the chosen finger. Avoid the edge of the finger as the underlying bone may be too close. For children younger than one year, there is too little tissue available in any of the fingertips. Okay, remember we said it's good for adults and older, one year or older. So according to the big advisement board that makes up the laws for your lab, CLSI, everybody remember them? Finger sticks should never be performed on children under the age of one year. Hint, hint, hint. Test question, test question. For this reason, dermal puncture is performed in the heel. Only on the medial and lateral borders of the plantar bottom surface is used. So let's use our anatomy we learned back in chapter six. This is the back of a foot, this is the front, this is the top, just like it's right here, okay? 
So can you tell me where the medial side of this foot is? Towards the midline, towards the middle? That's a teal, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a toes, so. So that's anterior and that's posterior. Like the middle of the heels, what you're wondering? Or the middle of the, the medial foot? aspect of the foot, where is it at? Oh, that's plantar region. Anybody else want to try? Okay, look at me. Look where my foot is. Where's my midline at? Right here, right? Which aspect of my foot is towards the midline? This side. This is the medial aspect of the foot. It says right here, page 165 in the, in the paragraph on the right. Only the medial and lateral borders of the bottom of the foot or the plantar aspect is supposed to be used. So here's medial, here's lateral, right? Because this is towards the outside. Borders of the plantar region. So you're not in here, you're on the border of it. Does that make sense? All right, just turn the page and look at figure 10-7. And it explains it all. You never want to go directly This bone is prominent, and they don't have a lot of flesh or fat on them when they're born. Babies don't, specifically preemies and newborns. Okay, so you've got a real risk of puncturing a bone, and what's some of the things that can happen when we puncture a bone? Infection, specifically. Okay, so we're talking about bone infections here. The first one I highlight is osteochondritis. Osteo meaning bone. And chondrocyte is a type of cell that's in your cartilage or in your bone. It makes the bones. Makes this, makes the, well, don't make them, but. And then itis, what's that mean, Kiara? Itis. When you have the itis, you got the itis. Infection. It's inflammation, infection. Okay, so this is infection of the bones. Specifically those cells. Like. Osteoarthritis, it's inflammation of the joints, or hepatitis, inflammation of the liver, itis. What's the other one they list there, um, Angel? I love making you read hard words. Osteomyelitis. So once again, we got bone and inf inflammation of the sheath that covers your bones, it's a membrane. All your bones have a thin membrane around them that supplies them with nerve endings and blood and things like that. When you break your bone, the bone don't have nerves in it. It's the membrane around that does, and that's what hurts. So that membrane can get inflamed from a puncture. So my uncle was cutting wood. He lives down here in um, Keno. Does anybody know what Keno is? Yeah, <laughs> I do. <laughs> it's where I'm from, basically. But he was cutting wood, and he, I think it was his left leg. It, the chainsaw came down and got him in the shin. And he got to the ER, and they looked at it, they washed it out, and they sewed it up. And a few days later, he started having problems at the infection site. It was looking red and hot and angry. So they had to take him back and open it up and open the wound up and look at it. And they took some x-rays and a CT of that bone, and they saw the little chainsaw marks where it had cut the bone just barely. The original physician didn't see those marks or they didn't look close enough. But they thought, oh, um, my membrane's intact, he's good to go. But because it got tore a little bit from that chainsaw blade, he got osteomyelitis. And this is hard to cure. It takes months, six months of antibiotics, strong antibiotics. He had to walk around with a little backpack in his IV bucket in the back, and he had a, a line in, and it would finish. He'd have to take it out and put another one in until he was done. It took him months to get rid of it. So, it's in the bone. Is that why yes, it's so hard to yeah, it's like a slow smoldering infection. It's very hard to cure. It's usually a bacteria that's resistant to antibiotics that causes it. It can be different bacteria, but. So you don't want to cause those problems, right? Um, so make sure you're using skin that is free from scars, cuts, bruises, and rashes. It's easily accessible and it has good capillary flow in it. Like the bone on your wrist or your knuckle is not, it's not good. There's not a lot of flesh there. <clears throat> and there's enough clearance and underlying 
um, flesh compared to where the bone is. You can see a neat little table that summarizes finger sticks are usually three millimeters at a maximum depth. This one only goes one. Heel sticks are, are two. Hint, hint, hint. Um, let me come down to the paragraph where it's at and read it to you. That's my brother. I'm sorry. Hang on there, my bar. We're almost done. I made that decision last weekend when I had my nephews, his nephews, his cousins over on Saturday, Saturday night, and then they left Sunday morning. And he is three and one, and the one-year-old just started walking, so I had to baby-proof my house like an hour. Because I was like, I still got a couple weeks for Henry. No, I had to go get four gates because I have two sets of stairs, electrical cover outlets, cabinet locks, and it was a scram. That's all I did all day. I was trying to get that done. You didn't get to see the family. So you said heel sticks are two inches? Let me come down here and read it to you. What page is it on? Okay, well, maybe I'll get this recording up here and you can finish it if you need to. Um, I've got two quizzes online ready to go for chapter 9 and chapter 10. We'll take eye quiz on face to face Monday. Okay? So that's your only homework is study your eye terms and take these two quizzes. Bye. It's okay. Uh, so, bottom of 164, I'm reading these facts to you that are test questions. Hint, hint, hint. To minimize the risk of inflammation and infection, the lancet should never penetrate more than three millimeters. Hint. If you're highlighting. I don't even see it. The bottom. Yeah. Is this yeah. Is there also at the top on the title? The heel incision. Is that where you're at? 165. Nope. 164. Right there, three millimeters. Oh, okay. Should never penetrate more than three millimeters. For a heel puncture, the maximum depth is two millimeters. Hint, hint, hint. A second time. Because the calcaneus, this heel bone right here, I just showed you a second ago, is there. Okay. For preemie babies, the recommended depth is 0 .6, 0 0.65 to 0.85. I don't think you'll be tested on those two specific numbers, but just know if it's even pr more premature to be a newborn, you got to go even more shallow, okay? But you should know the difference between 0 0.85 millimeter versus what a two millimeter is, okay? I know you don't really understand millimeters that much, like I do, I use them every day, but just understand that 0 0.65 is more shallow than a one millimeter. Okay. All right. The width should not exceed 2.5. Once again, I'm not sure if that's going to be a test question for me. I haven't seen that one. Um, and I'm not sure if you need to memorize that number, but be aware of it and where to find it. Okay. Some of them have another width of 1.75. And it tells you why these are better for preemies and their sweeping arc method as opposed to a puncture method. Right here at the bottom of 164 on the right. Capillary beds may lie close to the skin. Wider cut severs more capillaries and produces greater flow without affecting nerve endings and bone tissue. Pretty neat. Okay, I've covered 165 on adults and older children. Um, on 165, on the right side, it's talking about never be performed on children under the age of one. You should use heel. No, no. And only on those surfaces we talked about in figure 10-7. Why don't you go on the arch? Because there's a lot of tendons here that connect your toes to your heel, and there's a lot of nerves there. It's real sensitive on the bottom of your foot. You can tell when you've got a little pebble in there, right? So you don't want to be poking that and damaging anything. <clears throat> For older infants, the big toe may be used if the heel is unacceptable. So say they got, I don't know, it's swallowed by uh, an injury or a burn. You can go to their toe for the infants. All right. But they make the statement, be aware that the heel may be calloused on young children who have begun to walk. Has anybody ever seen skin on a baby? 
even a walking baby, it is always buttery smooth. There's no calluses on a baby. I think that's overkill, but it's not for me. Right? So I've talked about how the book tells you right here, and I've, in my experience, I've been all over the place on fingers. Uh, I'm not going to go through bleeding tests specifically. I'm going to give you the short version right here. And you, it, it's up to you to go back and read it, which I recommend. Sometimes we need to do a bleeding time test on patients. Um, and so what it encompasses, this one that they're explaining to you, the, the method here, is putting a blood pressure cuff on someone and just inflating it to like, I don't know, 40 or 60 millimeters mercury. Like if, if this is halfway up on the dial, they're only saying go like right here. And then you're going to take their forearm and use one of these type devices and click and you're going to wait for that first drop to well up and you'll take a filter. It looks almost like a coffee filter. Turn the page and look at uh, page 172. You'll set a timer and you'll dab that drop that welled up and you'll turn the filter and when it's done welling up, you'll dab the next one. And you'll do that until they're finished bleeding. And then you stop the timer and that's how long it took them to stop bleeding. So why don't they just do like a PTINR test or something? Well, not every clotting issue comes from a drug that you take. There's also hemophilia and genetic issues that people have where they don't clot correctly. Do you all remember me talking the other day about, you should have this question in the forefront of your mind, asking them when we were talking about procedures for a regular blood draw. Like you walk in the room, you introduce yourself, you explain the procedure, you ask them if they've had blood drawn before. And then one more question usually. Are you on? Yes. So that's something I expect you to know. You should be thinking about it often. Here it's important because blood thinners, it'll tell you if you read in this chapter further, Heparin pretty much quits working a few hours after you're, you're done administering it. Warfarin takes a 24 hours to get out of your system. Coumadin. Aspirin, which is a blood thinner, takes like 7 to 14 days to stop working on you. So if a patient needs a bleeding time test and they didn't take, stop taking their aspirin until like 3 days ago, they're still getting anticoagulant effects. and You're not going to get a good time that's accurate. So you got to ask them. You take any medicines that thin your blood? Are you on any aspirin or anything like that? Did you stop it like you were supposed to seven days ago if that was their order to do that? No, I quit on Wednesday because I forgot. Well, we might as well not even put you through this and we'll just reschedule you to come back and do it when you're bitten off of it. You know what I mean? So be aware of blood thinners. No matter what you're doing, you're in there taking blood. You should know what's going on with their blood in terms of that. Okay? So I, I, I'm putting it on you to go back and read through these procedures here. But as for uh, lecture, it's done.